would say the maths and the science are very clear that we have to adjust our structures to bring about the adjustments that we need to make in terms of our emissions. Let's talk a bit more about that because there's uh, this two degree target and there's a recent spate or spat of articles about whether this, uh, this goal should be uh, just binned. Can you quickly recap uh, what the two degrees target is, why we should care and what your position is? Okay. Well, first, the two degrees C is about the rise in the global average temperature that, that scientists have informed the process, but they've not defined whether it's dangerous or not. The political process, the civil society process that goes on within negotiations, that has deemed that the impacts of two degrees C are um, above two degrees C. Those impacts are too dangerous collectively for us to, um, <clears throat> to condone, uh, to accept and to move towards and below that is just about acceptable. So it's become this threshold between a series of impacts above which are considered dangerous and below which are acceptable. Let's not think it's desirable. Certainly for many people in some of the poorer parts of the world and the low-lying parts um, of the globe particularly, um, they are going to suffer very severe, severe implications of 2 degrees C. So for them 2 degrees C is far from um, desirable, far from appropriate. Nevertheless at the global level, given where we are, this has come out as the, as the most appropriate threshold. And certainly there can be very strong moral arguments for, make, for making a, a case for a lower temperature. Um, the problem is that we've left it so late that 2 degrees C itself looks uh, to be pretty much on the cusp of what we could possibly achieve if we pulled out all stops. I think we can still achieve 2 degrees C. So, it, it, so society collectively just is the de determined 2 degrees C is the appropriate threshold. Um, and it's worth bearing in mind that that's a global average and that plays out very differently and across, across regions. I mean, 2 degrees C as a global average is about 7 degrees in the Arctic. So you start to think of the implications of that in terms of, 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 of the melting of the Arctic and obviously indeed at the poles of the Antarctic indeed you see much higher temperatures as well. So it has major, re, um, major different uh, regional repercussions that are very severe for a lot of communities around the globe and certainly for a lot of ecosystems. Um, so the next thing I wanted to explain is... Well, um, well what's your... You've, you've kind of why we should care and your position is that we can just about do it so okay. moving on how do we do that in the uh, next three to six months what do you want to see civil society doing in the lead up to Paris or separately yeah to make two degrees still on the table still on the cusp yeah. of, of doable well the first thing I would say is that we often have, I think you might use the language of a goal or two degree C goal or two degree mm. C target and I'm increasingly moving away from that if you look at the language from international negotiations it's not about a goal or a target, it's about an obligation of a duty. Now I think we already start to approach obligations and duties through a different mindset. The policies we put in place um, that for a duty or an obligation are quite different for those that we put in for a target or a goal. So I think we need to move away from this idea it's something we cannot achieve. It's something that we are obliged to achieve and we have repeatedly said that. Now because we happen to have failed so far to move in the right direction means that that obligation now is much more demanding. You know, or to achieve that obligation is much more demanding. So I, I think it's still viable. The next, the next three to six to nine months, the lead up to Paris, um, what we need to be doing is, is driving that agenda very hard, providing it with all, and as scientists, it's providing them with the information that's clear um, and, and honest as well. I think we need to be, as scientists and academics engaged in this debate, we need to, we need to be quite, quite direct and clear about the maths and very blunt as to what that message actually means so that there's no misunderstanding of what comes out of the science. For wider society, I think it's finding the, the, the techniques um, and the approaches that allow us to mobilize action. So in the next six to nine months, we're not gonna six to nine months, we're not going to bring about dramatic reductions in emissions. But what, what we can do is be arguing for the, the, the structures, the institutions, the policies, um, and the mindset of us as, a, as, you know, as a populations that, uh, that allow policymakers to put in place the, the, the appropriate structures to bring about the levels of changes that we, that we would need. And the other thing to push hard on Paris is that Paris, at the moment, the, set, the focus appears to be about post-2020. Well, Paris is 2015, and between 2015 and 2020, there's plenty of time for very significant action. And I think that to, to think that post-2020 is when we need to act misunderstands climate change, misunderstands climate change science that by 2020 we will have used up even more of the very limited carbon budgets that we have. So that, so that the more we can act before 2020, then the, the less onerous, though still very challenging, will be the tasks after 2020. And I think getting that message across to policymakers, this is not just about 2020 in the future. 
And this is a real problem of climate change. We've always pushed it into the long grass to somewhere in the future. Negotiations are never about what we're going to start to do tomorrow. They're about what we're going to start to do. In fact, what others will start to do, because no longer will we, we, will we be in power by then, what others will have to do in the future. And that completely has misunderstood the climate change um, science. And as scientists and, and the academic community, we have not pushed that hard enough. That when you fail today, it doesn't mean you can succeed by doing more tomorrow. When you fail today with a cumulative problem, and it's already enormously challenging, that means you're locking in or um, you know, significant changes for the future or reducing your probability of success. Okay. Worst case scenario, there's a weak deal at Paris or we have another Kyoto-style yeah. farce. When do you think that credible scientists will come out and say, you know what, don't bother. No matter what we do, we're going to get four degrees. And do you think you might be one of those scientists? I don't think credible scientists could say that. Um, and that the, one of our saving graces here, and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a benefit as much as it is a, um, a disadvantage, is that there's a lot of uncertainty in exactly what the carbon budget looks like. Now, from a policy perspective, it, whatever we do, whichever end of that uncertainty you're on, you've got to do everything you can possibly imagine that you can achieve. So from a policy perspective, the message is very, very clear. From a science perspective, if we don't achieve everything we need in 2025, 20, 2015, what that means is that the chances of holding to 2 degrees C are reduced. It doesn't mean that we, we won't still achieve 2 degrees C. We're already probably pushing those probabilities quite hard on 2 degrees C. But you know, the, the, science, the, the science of climate change is incredibly complex. I think we've, we've got the scientists have done a really superb job in getting a good handle on what's going on, have a good understanding of what the carbon budgets look like for these sorts of temperatures, but there's still quite a big range in, that, in, the, in those carbon budgets. So that flexibility that comes out of the, the, the natural process of science means that no, no credible scientist can come out and say, we can no longer achieve 2 degrees C, at least not in the next, you know, uh, next few years. Um, at some point you pass, even the, you know, all the budgets will have been blown, um, and unless then you can find some other you know, the geoengineering techniques which people are talking about but I think disturbingly take away from us actually reducing some reducing our emissions today so they are a real risk and a danger geoengineering even though I think we should be researching them that they they undermine the, the, the severity of the message that we're trying to get across um, by the time we get to 2025 then I think you, the probabilities of two degrees C look incredibly slim and when we think about our obligations, 2 degrees C obligations, they are about staying below. They're not about a 50-50 chance of 2 degrees C. They're not about a 60 to 70% chance of exceeding it. They're about staying below. In other words, if you live next to a nuclear power station, then you expect the power station to have a 99.99% chance of actually not blowing up. Similarly, if you say we are, we are going to stay below 2 degrees C, we must make every effort to stay below 2 degrees C, that means that you want a very high probability of remaining below 2 degrees centigrade. Unfortunately, we've already lost that opportunity now. You know, there's a chance that we already have put so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that we're going to go above 2 degrees C. So the, the, the later we leave it, the, the smaller the probabilities for hitting that target and the higher the probabilities for hitting a, a higher target. But at no point can a credible scientist say it's too late um, for 2 degrees C. And it's, it's not in the next 5 or 10 years. What they would then have to say is that the probability of 2 degrees C is now incredibly slim and we've got a pretty high chance of three degrees of staying below three degrees C, and as we continue to do nothing again, then that, those probabilities will gradually go, and then you start to say, well, three degrees C looks very unlikely, we're heading towards four degrees C. The concern, of course, is that the emissions are going up almost exponentially at the moment. You know, the rate of the growth, the rate of growth in this millennium of carbon dioxide emissions is three times greater than in the last decade of the 20th century, when we claim to be very concerned about climate change. So that means our curve emissions is just going up like this. And uh, the implications of that are that every day that we fail, we get a lot more emissions in the atmosphere. The following day, we get even more. And, and therefore, we're not talking about post-2030. We're talking about doing something very significant in the very short term. And even for 3 and 4 degrees C, we start to be talking about locking society into those sorts of um, or reasonable probabilities of those sorts of temperatures, even in the 2020s. So we have to remove, move away from the idea this is a 2050 problem, this is a post-2030 problem. This is a problem that we face, we absolutely face it today. And again, for the activists, for the companies, for any concerned person who wants to, wants to contribute towards Paris, we have to drive that agenda home, that it, this is about us doing things now and today. It's not about any further procrastination.